been doing since January of this year. And we are going step by step to create a beautiful landscape in your backyard. So we'll wait a couple more minutes to before we get started with the class. And if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat uh, or you will also have an opportunity to unmute yourself and ask the question at the end of the class. And Boone. And recording is, uh, the classes are being recorded and for everybody that's registered for the classes, you will get a recording, access to the recording. You can go back and listen to all the previous classes if you miss them or if you want to listen to them again. So my name is Suma Mudan and I've been a master gardener for the last eight years. And um, we have been running community classes both uh, as Landscape Success uh, and uh, Grow Your Own. Um, so these have been um, like specifically, specifically made for community. So you guys can uh, get the basics of how to set up your home garden, how to maintain and how to take care of the uh, usual problems. So hopefully these classes are helping you and we do send out a survey at the end of the class, each class, so that we can know what you're looking for and how we can make these programs better for you if you want any new topics or if you want to change, if you want us to change anything. So please put all those ideas into your survey. Uh, so uh, today's speaker is Boone Holiday. And he actually doesn't need any introduction. Uh, most of you who have been attending classes have been um, fortunate enough to hear him talk about varied uh, topics. He knows a lot about a lot. And um, uh, he, but to give you a little bit of background on Boone, uh, he's our uh, Fort Bend County Extension agent uh, in horticulture for Texas A&M AgriLife Agri Extension. So he holds an undergraduate degree in horticulture from Stephen Austin State University and master's degree in agricultural education from Texas A&M University. So long before he attained all these fancy degrees, he was an avid gardener. And since he was a very, very young uh, person, he started uh, dabbling in gardening. And um, that, so he has both the practical and the technical knowledge about all things uh, related to gardening. So he brings previous experience as horticulture staff at Moody Gardens in Galveston, Producers Cooperative in Bryan, and the Texas A&M Department of Horticultural Sciences in College Station. So having work experience in many horticultural industries from retail horticulture to landscape design and irrigation installation, he brings that knowledge paid with enthusiasm into Fort Bend County programming efforts. He is happily married to Sony, who in her own right is a great uh, uh, grower of uh, cut flower gardens. Uh, and uh, they have one daughter, Bailey. Um, and uh, he, he, he still resides in Full Share, Texas. And we are fortunate to have him talk to us about edible gardening. You will get a lot of uh, new ideas on how to inject edibles everywhere, sprinkle them everywhere in your garden and make use of your garden space. And without much further ado, here is the mic to Boone. Thank you, Suma. And uh, we also uh, have uh, Nancy Chef with our, our programs director for Fort Bend County Master Gardeners with us. And uh, <clears throat> they'll both be wrangling our questions that come through the chat and uh, they'll be making the decision uh, to, uh, to bring those up kind of during the presentation um, or maybe trying to tackle those, adding uh, online links, et cetera, in the chat feature there. <clears throat> if we don't answer your question during the presentation, uh, probably means that we wanna spend a little bit more time on it at the end uh, of the uh, content so that we could we could focus a little bit more. So uh, just uh, roll with us. I see some 
some uh, awesome names here on the uh, participant list. Uh, Betty, I hadn't seen Betty in a while. Hopefully, Betty, hopefully you're doing really good. Uh, a lot of other good names in there. So uh, glad you're with us today. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, get to screen sharing. You get to see the backside of my left eye there for one second. And we are going to get going here. So are we is recording in progress? Yes. Oh, fantastic. OK. All right, so we are uh, doing the landscape success series. I believe we have one more class uh, this year after this one on winter gardening your plants, uh, preparing them for the cold winter. Uh, so uh, make sure that you have that on your calendar and join us for that last class of the series and um, start getting ready for our program series for next year. Uh, be thinking um about ideas we're going to um evaluate this series here real shortly and we'll start building our program series and topics for next year so if you have any ideas we'll give you a chance here at the end of the presentation to uh, uh complete an online survey uh, we, we appreciate uh any and all time to offer your suggestions on new topics or anything else that could make this um, program better in the future. So uh, we wrap all of this around a collection of principles that we call EarthKind with uh, the Texas A&M uh, Horticulture Department and with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. And, and basically this is a, a collection of these principles that focuses on the environment. Um, and, and it helps us to ensure that uh, us engaging in gardening for our, for our own aesthetics, beauty, and personal pleasure exercise, um, that we're doing that in a way that kind of pairs up with environmental stewardship. And it wraps around this list here of these guiding principles. And so we think that if we can understand and abide by all these principles here, then we will be good uh, stewards to our environment. And these include uh, starting <clears throat> with the planning and the design process of the garden. So really, before we've done anything at all, is planning and designing uh, our landscape in a way that, that's going to um, minimize uh, unnecessary inputs, um, plant material that is probably not the best for the spot. We have to do a lot of pruning to that throughout the year. Um, inputs of chemical fertilizers, pesticides, um, and then material that comes out of the garden that if it's not composted would um, end up in a landfill. Uh, thinking about practical turf grass areas, uh, we're, we're kind of locked into a culture right now where we just think we need to have uh, manicured turf grass is our dominant landscape feature and then put a tree here and put some flowers there uh, but trying to kind of break that philosophy uh, and utilizing turf only where it's practical um, next one is appropriate plant selection so this is you know the right plant for the right place and really the right plants so these are native and adapted plant material that want to grow here um, and want to grow without a whole lot of additional inputs as far as water, fertilizer, uh, and agricultural chemicals to keep those plants alive. Next one is soil improvement. So everything starts with the quality of our soil, the health of our soil. If we can build a good quality base of soil, then we can get a lot done with, uh, with limited input on our end. Uh, efficient irrigation and rainwater catch, catchment. So this is uh, minimizing the amount of uh, municipal or potable water that we're having to apply to our home landscapes and also looking at ways that we can capture rainwater and use that in our landscapes 
uh, effectively. Uh, the use of mulches uh, for lots of different reasons. Um, beyond the aesthetics of mulch in the landscape, they conserve water, they moderate soil temperature, they eventually break down into organic matter, uh, they minimize weeds in the garden, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of good uh, reasons that we use wood mulches. And then appropriate maintenance. Uh, it's just the, the correct practices of maintaining this landscape throughout the year. One, that we're not being wasteful of our own time and resources, but that we're not uh, maybe overdosing our landscape where some of those inputs would end up downstream from us and have impact on uh, wetlands and wildlife. So be thinking about all these for more information on EarthKind. Um, you can go to the website, which is um, earth-kind.tamu.edu. And I'll have that URL again at the end of the presentation in the resources for you to um, write, write down. So today we're going to be talking about edible landscaping. And uh, this is a very popular topic for us. And uh, you know, really the concept here is that we're creating a, a mix of uh, ornamentals, vegetables, herbs, and fruit uh, that work together in harmony that provide a aesthetically pleasing, uh, well-designed landscape. Uh, well, we can sneak in some food products in there. So the vegetables, herbs, and fruits at certain times of the year we can enjoy the benefit of those uh, as they uh, are harvested. Um, so, you know, we got this space here that we're paying taxes on. And um, if we're just hiring somebody to come and just, you know, cut the shrubs and cut the grass and trim the trees, that's great. But that's, you know, we're not getting the maximum value as we could get out of that space. Um, this is, you know, all parts of the landscape. So, um, you know, we, a, a person may assume when we say edible landscape, we're just talking about the, the front yard or the backyard, but, but doing um, this combination of plant material in all parts of your home landscape, there's bound to be areas that work for any of these plant uh, materials uh, that they'll grow well for you. Um, and then beyond that added value is that, you know, we're, we're encouraging pollinators uh, and beneficial insects uh, into our landscape. Uh, and these beneficials um, are, are here to limit, to help us limit the amount of pesticides that otherwise we may have to use in the landscape. So lots of wins why we would do it. Uh, but we will also kind of go through some of the limitations as well. So here, here's kind of the concept is we, you know, we've got a beautiful landscape here uh, that we've got a mix of colors, textures in the, um, in this trail in certain times of the year, uh, just a stroll through the garden can end up bringing a basket of hearth uh, inside and give us a mix of uh, items to cook from. Um, and we can, we can schedule this in a way that provides something a little different uh, at different times of the year, different seasons that produce different vegetables and fruits. So, you know, there's just some basics here and these are our common sense, I think, but um, the, you know, the only bad name that we get and, you know, being an extension, you know, I work with a lot of different groups and sometimes I'm working with the regulatory side of this and I'll get pictures from code enforcement officers or HOA coordinators and asking me what my thoughts are on a particular landscape uh, before they go out and, uh, you know, issue some type of a notice of violation for the homeowners association. So, you know, be cognizant of that. Read your homeowner association or civic association guidelines 
uh, before we engage in this and understand what the parameters are there so that you can be uh, within that in, in doing this project, particularly in the front yard situation. Um, uh, we're, use, we're using plants that have a pleasing form. Uh, and this is the aesthetics, right, of the, not just the plants themselves, but how we've placed those plants in the landscape. So now they're becoming part of the design. And, you know, it's not just a, a standalone plant, but we're trying to do this in a way that, that builds something more than just food in the, in the garden, um, that it becomes part of a picture of your home landscape. Um, we have plants or leaves within those plants that really need to be holding up uh, throughout the whole growing season. Uh, certain plants are just not candidates for this because um, maybe as they mature or become overly mature, they, they do become unsightly. The leaves maybe will, will turn uh, brown, yellow. Uh, plants will defoliate. Plant structure kind of falls apart so we will talk about some plants to avoid um, later on here in the presentation and while harvesting you know uh, you know be aware that you know we don't want to you know come go out there and harvest too much at one time we want to keep the aesthetics of that uh, plant or that area of plants um, so you know examples there would you know be cilantro or or uh, leafy greens like lettuce um, where you may overdo it and um, create an area that's unattractive. And, and beyond uh, these HOA guidelines, uh, just be a good neighbor. Um, you know, they, um, they have a, uh, buy-in on the value of your home and the the uh, well-kept nature of the of the neighborhood that uh, keeps their property values up keeps the marketability of their homes up and you know all this is done by each person um, keeping their their own space clean and tidy and attractive uh, so keep keep these plantings well kept throughout the growing season um, if, a, if it comes to a point where the seasonality of this partic these particular plants are past maturity, then, you know, think quick about removing those and then planting something in its space uh, to avoid that, um, that uh, moment where uh, it maybe is not very aesthetic. Clean up these garden structures when they're out of season. If you have some type of a vining or crop um, that utilizes a trellising, um, let's, you know, as soon as we're done, those are finished up for the season. Just pull those up, you know, try to design trellising and other structures in ways that can be modular. Uh, so like um, you know, hardware or hardwire fencing you can cut into certain sections and use um, wire to hold them together so that when you're done, you can kind of fold and flatten those out, stack them and, you know, put them up um, on the side of the house or back, uh, back in the garage or behind the garage out of the way. And, uh, and use uh, aesthetically pleasing hardscape materials uh, that, that blend into the landscape. And this is, uh, you know, anything from um, edging materials, uh, retaining walls, but mainly the statement here is guided around containers. Um, you know, think about the, the aesthetic quality of those containers, uh, large terracotta, uh, painted um, kiln uh, pots or large containers are very attractive naturally, but um, just going out and, and putting um, Tupperware, Tupperware bins or, you know, these plastic storage bins uh, in, the, in the front yard may not qualify uh, as aesthetically pleasing for all your neighbors. So just keep, keep them in mind, keep their view of your home in mind uh, so that, 
you can do this with everybody uh, being happy that you're doing it so here's a, a list of a, a couple of the, the common problem makers uh we'll, we're gonna gonna say that these are ones that we want to grow in our garden, probably in the backyard or in areas that's not visible from the front view of the, the property. Uh, bananas, um, you know, if you've got an area along the side of the house where you're trying to block the view uh, into your into the private uh, area of your side yard or the backyard, bananas are a good choice for that. But in the, in the front landscape, um, probably not one because they are. As they get older, <clears throat> they do get larger. Uh, the corn clumps do start spreading out. And so beyond the, the aesthetics of the plant, you may end up with something there that is gonna be very difficult for you to remove. Uh, when the time comes to do that, uh, these corms, if you've grown bananas, you'll know that they um, become um, extensive and heavy and they grow deep into the ground. So um, we don't wanna start that process. Uh, you'll end up with something that will take over the front of the house. And, and beyond that, uh, with any type of freeze or frost damage to the foliage, uh, the whole top part of the plant kind of melts down into this you know, brown, yellow, um, microwaved foliage look and uh, not very attractive. Um, for uh, your neighborhood. Similar with uh, corn, uh, early on, uh, early season corn is pretty attractive. Uh, we get these, uh, you know, large upright uh, tassels, uh, pollen tassels. <clears throat> but, you know, usually about halfway through the season, the, the, the long strappy leaves of corn start getting uh, insects. Uh, they're real prone to white fly and a whole mess of aphids. And then you get uh, honeydew, which is this glossy, sticky residue, followed by sooty mole, which is this kind of grayish, black, hazy fungal growth on the foliage. And then as the plant gets older, the leaves get brown and crispy and start falling over. And again, not very attractive. Uh, okra, very similar to that okra later in the season. The plant just starts looking pretty rough. Uh, it's prone to a lot of foliar diseases, which the, the leaves themselves will turn yellow, have spots or necrotic or dead areas on the leaves, and they just get real big. They get tall, and you have to harvest these pods. In midsummer, you really need to harvest the okra pods every day, or they get large and gangly and woody and uh, be can become unsightly as well. I put a question mark here next to this one because there are some varieties out there. If you're searching around online, um, one, you'll look for dwarf. Uh, there are several dwarf, so they're gonna, gonna stay smaller, a more compact plant. The pods are smaller. Uh, so uh, like if you've, if you've grown okra before, you know, one household maybe needs one, two plants and that's all you need. Uh, they produce a ton of fruit and, and people really don't eat that much okra uh, for long periods of time. I think I, for me, after the third time in the summer, I'm kind of done with okra, but these dwarf varieties can produce a plant that does look more attractive. They don't get too big and gangly. And there's also some varieties that have variegated foliage, which means it has a yellow, or light green stripes on the leaves. And um, for all the Aggie fans out there, there are some purple or maroon foliaged uh, okra plants. Uh, the flowers on okra uh, basically are similar to a hibiscus. They're in the same family. So it's a, it's a pretty hibiscus looking flower with the maroon foliage on it and a small plant. You could argue that maybe this is attractive, but note that once that plant gets past its peak maturity, um, you know, you need to take it out of there before the leaves start getting curled up and the plant falls apart on you. Uh, tomatoes, 
The vast majority of tomatoes are just a no-go, as you see from the picture here. They're, even if it is a determinant, which is a bush type tomato, at some point they're all gonna look like this. They've got foliar diseases on it. They've got stink bugs uh, all over them. They just kind of melt down. Now there, again, there are a couple of these patio tomato varieties, which are more compact that, you know, arguably, you could put it into a large pot in an area and for the first part of the growing season, it may be attractive. But as the plant matures and even while it has fruit on it, the, the quality of the plant is going to diminish. You start seeing curly leaves, you start seeing brown foliage, leaf drop, you start inviting uh, stink bugs and leaf footed bugs uh, into the garden. So, you know, really not one we want to have out front for everybody. Uh, squash, and really squash and cucumbers, uh, pumpkins, you know, anything of these, these viney uh, warm season crops. Again, they, they, they vine everywhere. <clears throat> and then about the time that you're harvesting any type of fruit off of them, the foliage really uh, starts to diminish in quality. You've got um, crinkled leaves with leaf spot, you have yellow leaves, you have disease leaves with uh, bacterial fungal leaf spot, virus, um, mosaic on the leaves. And then of course we have squash vine borer, which for most of us around here, if you've grown those, you know that um, they're going to shorten the season if you even get to harvest uh, fruit off of it. The squash vine borer lays its larvae or its eggs onto the vines and then the, the um, larvae hatches and crawls into the vine and eats the inside of the vine. Then the whole plant wilts down to nothing and looks real bad. So again, that's just why we, we wanna move these out of sight from the public so that we don't cause any neighborhood controversies. So, you know, just a couple of ideas. This is kind of what we're going for here is we're, we're talking about a, a, a mix of plant material, edible and not, uh, maybe not, and different sizes uh, and different colors and textures to add value to this landscape design. Again, we're not just talking about putting food in the garden out front, but we're but we're implementing that into a well thought out landscape design so that it's part of the function of the overall aesthetics of your landscape. Okay. Summer, how are we doing? Any, any questions, anything coming in? Not yet. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, so, we want to we want to do this. Let's be realistic about the sunlight. Uh, most of our garden vegetables and and the, and the majority of our garden herbs and fruit uh, need full sun to to grow a grow healthy grow a healthy plant and to mature into any type of uh, perceivable harvest. So we're talking about at least six hours, probably more than that, of direct sun every day. And um, I wish I would have put direct sun on here because, uh, you know, some people, um, you know, they don't want to admit that they don't have that. Um, whether it's the angle of your house, uh, we're talking about southern exposure, so from from southeast to south to southwest uh, exposure is what we want. If the front of your house is facing direct north, then we're not getting much sun, particularly in the winter months, we're really not getting any direct sun in that location. And then if you have trees, if you have deciduous trees, which means those are trees that lose their foliage in the winter, then we have to be realistic about the seasonality of the edible plants that we want to put there. We're only going to be able to grow 
those crops while the trees are dormant, while they are leafless, so that now we have a season, winter, where light will penetrate through that tree canopy uh, and actually get down to where these plants are on the ground. And then the rest of the year, uh, while the trees have foliage, then um, we're not going to really expect to grow any fruits, vegetables, or herbs underneath that canopy because of the lack of direct sunlight in that area. Uh, the more sunlight that we remove from, from, the, from the majority of plants, you know, everything goes downhill. The plants start growing taller and spindly, spindlier because they're trying to reach the sunlight and then they, they get, they lodge over, they fall down, uh, they just look spindly. Uh, the leaves are yellow, uh, the leaves are smaller than they should be and they're weak and they're prone to stress and then stress brings on disease and insect issues. So that's why we, we have to you know, help you be honest about the amount of sunlight. So really right now, this time of year is a good time to go out and walk the landscape uh, even this time of day right now. You're gonna find out if um, if the sun, because as we get into winter, the sun's going to ease off down towards the south and create a, a more of a side angle um, that's going to even further limit the amount of direct sunlight on the plants. So, so go do that and look to see where you're getting sun, and where you're not, and that's going to help you design where we're going to put these edibles in the landscape. Soil testing is a is very important because we need to make sure that the plants have the fertility that they need to grow well. We don't want to grow any of these plants as you've seen from that picture earlier with these ornamental cabbages and kales that just look spectacular. That's because the plants have the fertility that they need to grow well. If we don't have the nutrients and the soil, uh, then again, the plants are going to be weak and spindly and we're not going to get the impact that we want, and we may get the issue with the neighbor or the homeowners association because those plants don't look great. Uh, so the way that we help ensure that is to give them the nutrition that they need, and so a soil test is the way to do that, and um, we might be able to put the a link to the soil testing um, website there in the chat box. It's just soiltesting.tamu.edu. And then just the routine diagnostic, I mean, the routine soil sample or the urban, I'm sorry, it's called the urban soil sample form is the one that you want there. And uh, the just the, the basic routine analysis, I think it's $12 plus the shipping to get the soil to the laboratory. It's a pretty good investment. What they're gonna do, they're gonna run an analysis on that soil and send you back a result of what's in the soil as far as your nutrients go. And it's gonna give you a recommendation of added nutrients to balance the fertility of the soil. Really the way to go. I can't preach it enough because you're gonna end up adding different nutrients at different levels to balance out the full picture of nutrients in your soil. If you don't do a soil test and you just go down to the garden center and buy what they tell you that you need, or you just pick up something and put out, one, we don't know if those are the right nutrients. And then we could also be over applying a nutrient that you already have in abundance in the soil, and that's going to cause um, some bad chemistry, we might just say, uh, is if we have overabundance of one nutrient in the soil, those molecular bonds and charges can, can impact the availability of the other nutrients that are there. So your plants are really starving because the soil is out of whack. So I can't uh, express this enough, a soil test, you know, the, the small amount of time and effort 
uh, and financial resource that you put into it, um, you will not regret because once we get that soil, once you get the soil nutrients balanced, you can grow anything. Um, it really is the limiting factor for a lot of people. It's just uh, not knowing and then, and then applying the wrong type of fertilizers uh, to the garden. And then the last one here is water. Uh, <clears throat> during the active growing season, so uh, for us, this is, you know, most of the whole year, except in the dead of winter, uh, we'll have about a month where there's not really much happening here. Uh, most plants are dormant, uh, but uh, every, you know, the other 11 months of the year, we're, we're growing. Uh, we're growing, you know, our cool season plants, which are going to be our, our late winter spring plants. And we've got our hot season plants, which is half of the year. And then we have another cool season in the fall. And then really in the dead of winter for about a month, maybe six weeks, um, we're, there's just not much going on. Most plants are kind of just sitting still, waiting for it to warm up a little bit. Uh, so that being said, most of the year we need to be thinking about water. So most plants are gonna need one inch of water per week. And this is total water, total water, one inch per week. Um, and this uh, notes here, the ET, this is not the extraterrestrial. This is uh, evapotranspiration, which uh, basically is a, it's a fancy term that basically notes the amount of available water. So this is taking um, water loss, um, with the amount of available water that's in the soil. <clears throat> so it's either evaporated through um, into the atmosphere uh, or it's being uh, used and transpired by the plants um, through, through, through the plant. And so basically what, what these um, local stations that talk about evapotranspiration, take that into account so, you know, midsummer, we have a day that, you know, is 100 degrees and we have 20 mile an hour winds in low humidity. Uh, that evapotranspiration rate is going to be very high. So we're going to need to water a little bit more during those periods. Uh, low humidity, um, high temperatures, and high wind. We add those up, then the evapotranspiration rate goes up, which just basically means we, need, we would need to probably water more than that one inch of water per week during those very stressful times, uh, weather times. Uh, but even further than that, this one inch per week is taking in all water that's applied. So that's rainfall, dew, um, and applied irrigation. So the fact that here in Fort Bend County, we, we average 46 inches of rain a year if we average that out throughout the year, that's about three quarters of an inch a week. So hypothetically, we're close to that, but we all know that we don't get uh, the re regularity of water uh, that's so nice for us. Uh, we get lump sum payments and then we have droughts. And uh, so in between those two, just keep track of the amount of rainfall. If we're not getting rain, then you need to be applying a little bit of water to these plants so that they continue growing health with health and that they don't go into a drought drought um, or moisture induced uh, stress complex, which can really set these plants back. So, so look at rainfall and for getting good rainfall, you don't really need to be doing any type of irrigation, but after a week or two of no natural rainfall, then we need to be maybe thinking about ways to apply additional water or supplemental water to these areas to keep, to keep these gardens looking good, looking healthy. Uh, hi, Bon. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one question. Uh, is there a soil test that people can do at their home by themselves? And if so, is there a kit that they can, that you recommend? Yeah, 
Uh, so if you'll remind me at the end of the presentation, I'll drop okay. the power, I'll drop the PowerPoint and I'll take us over to the soil testing lab website, walk them through that process. Okay. The answer is yes, and it's the same. It's the same lab. Um, you can do all this at home and 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 send that um, through the mail from home to the lab and get those results. Um, it's it's pretty pretty easy to do. Um, less than that, <clears throat> you know, any of these uh, home quick home tests for fertility where you just stick the little probe into the soil you're not going to get what you need. I mean, it just has a little dial that says fertile or not fertile, and that, that doesn't help you at all. And then there's also the, the little home chemistry kits where you can, you know, go in with the, the buffer solutions and um, still not going to get the results back the way that you would want it in a way that you can respond to it. You know, you're going to find out how much is in there but it's not going to come with a way that recommends a certain value of those nutrients to be added. So really utilizing either our soil lab up in College Station, there are several, several other soil labs in the state of Texas that you can use as well, but we find that ours is really the easiest to do, and we provide the results that are easiest for you to interpret. But uh, I'll go once we finish the PowerPoint, I'll go through the process and show you how to do that. Any other questions right now? Not really. Okay. <coughs> All right. So tips here. And again, this kind of just goes back to landscape principles. Landscape principles are similar to fashion or floral design. Um, if you if you looked if you're you know if you went to fashion school or if you went and got a degree in, in floral design or art this is all very similar guiding principle uh, principles and elements of design um, and this is basically to create you know emphasis within the way that we place these plants in the landscape to, to look appealing. And the way that we do that is we mix things up and we look for different textures of foliage. So size of the leaves, uh, you know, grasses and bulbs and, and other uh, uh, monocots have kind of upright strappy leaves. We've got other green shrubs that have uh, more of a, a low mounding effect. We have columnar, multi-trunk. Uh, so you add all these different types of textures and you place those in a way that they contrast with each other. We wanna look at different types of interesting foliage with colors, textures, shapes, and sizes. And then use those in a, in a thoughtful way to create additional um, visual value to, um, to the landscape. Uh, <clears throat> use uh, plants with the inter interesting flowers, particularly if it's a large flowered plant, like a, like a hibiscus, uh, use those in a way that are gonna act as a focal point or a dominant feature within the uh, area. Something that draws your eye to that spot and then you want to have this varying color, texture, shape, and sizes that create rhythm um, and unity within the landscape. You may need to do some trimming, deadheading, and seasonal replacement of some of these plants to keep that picture of the landscape looking good throughout the year. And I think this is probably the part here that most people you know, when I hear horror stories of, you know, front yard edible landscapes is that we didn't think about this landscape design. We're basically just following the principles and elements of landscape design, but we're doing it with edible plants mixed into it. Um, take your time in doing this. Be, be thoughtful. Um, in the design. 
Uh, I think as gardeners, we're all guilty of, uh, you know, going Saturday to the local nursery and getting a, you know, a cup of coffee and walking around the nursery and falling in love with a plant that you see and you have no idea where it's going to go, where you're going to put this plant, but you buy it and you take it home and you stick it somewhere and it just doesn't ever really work out because you didn't, you didn't take the time to think about this design and how each of those plants are part of this bigger picture of our garden um, art, really. This is really garden art we're creating. Keep yourself a journal um, of this garden and note the successes of certain plants that did great for you, that were real performers. And then maybe some plants that just didn't work out like you expected them to. Write those down because if your memory is like mine, uh, you know, the next season, you don't want to make that same mistake again because we just forgot about how bad that plant was. Um, you want to plan ahead early. So particularly for seasonal or annual garden plants, uh, you know, stuff like cabbages. You know, there's a couple maybe or ornamental cauliflowers that are beautiful, but you know, when they come out, they're coming out. And now we need to have something to, to fill that spot or we're going to have an eyesore uh, right there in the middle of our landscape. So be planning ahead, thinking about what is going to be the replacement for a certain area of the garden and have those plants ready or know where you can access those plants. Uh, so that they are ready to jump in and to fill that void uh, immediately. So there is a question here. <coughs> yep. Are there any edibles that do not attract rabbits? <laughs> <laughs> uh, are, they, are they from Cross Creek Ranch? Um, the, really the answer is no. Yeah. Um, there's a whole gang of, of strategies. If you did a deep dive on the internet, um, there's just not a whole lot of, um, repellent strategies that through a land grant university we've validated, but there's a lot of ideas uh, things that people have tried and had limited success with that you can find on the internet. So I think, um, you know, looking at those, which ones, you know, might make sense for you to try, uh, which ones, you know, if it doesn't sound good, just reading it, don't do it. Uh, but really for rabbits, the only way you're going to be able to do it is by isolating the garden or these particular plants um, limiting access from the, from the rabbits. So some type of a, a fencing um, that will discourage them from, from working in the garden or, or letting them access the garden easily. You know, if they can get in, have a good meal and get out without any problems, they're going to keep coming back um, more and more. And they're going to invite all their friends to come eat there as well. So uh, there just really isn't, once you have um, rabbits that, um, and even uh, mice and rats, uh, once they find that you have edibles, uh, herbs, vegetables, or, or fruit in this spot, um, they're going to keep coming back. So it's either, um, limiting access, repelling them or trapping and removing if that, um, is available for you. All right, so um, next step here is to think about fruits. And um, if you've got a tree that uh, that's in a spot and maybe is slated for removal, uh, one, it's just gotten too big uh, or it's succumbed to freeze damage or disease and uh, it's coming down, then we'll think about replacing those with, uh, with some fruiting trees or fruiting plants. Um, or adding some uh, fruit trees to your existing landscape to kind of continue this edible factor 
uh, of the home garden. Not just any plant is gonna work here. This is kind of a short list of some fruits that we uh, would recommend for many reasons. And these include figs, a range of citrus, which are kumquats, uh, Meyer lemons, Ujikitsu lemon, uh, Satsuma. Um, you know, those are kind of our standards. You could also go and go, and go into grapefruit, uh, true oranges, and, uh, and limes. Uh, but these are kind of our standards and really, um, at least for the kumquat, ujikitsu, and satsuma, these are the more cold hardy of the citrus. So that if we do have light freezes, uh, these ones get through those light freezes unfazed. Now, winter storm Uri was a different story. We lost most of our citrus here in Fort Bend County, but these are the stronger of the citrus. And uh, they produce a pretty good amount of fruit on a small plant. So uh, those four citrus uh, pears, um, mangoes, uh, definitely a container, uh, moringa, plum, blueberry, and all these are different sizes. They flower at different times of the year. Uh, they're either single or multi-trunk. Um, they're uh, more temperate or tropical in appearance. So, you know, use a plant that has a foliage that maybe blends in with your landscape design. Um, and then also, you know, what's, what type of fruit do you like to eat? Um, so each of these, you can kind of envision how they would fit in different areas in the home landscape. For instance, a, a plum tree or a pear, uh, would would be a good replacement for an ornamental small tree or flowering tree in the landscape because they have a single tr trunk upright uh, appearance, a good uh, structure to the plant overall, good landscape uh, appeal uh, versus something like a fig that's just kind of a big squatty multi-trunk um, you know, a lot of times they're not the most aesthetically pleasing. They kind of do what they want to do. Um, so, you know, be thinking about how you want your total design of the landscape to look and feel, and then use the right fruit trees that add more value instead of take away from the value of the landscape design. And um, again, uh, we choose these. This list is kind of, again, a short list of trees that are pretty easy to grow, that do not need a whole lot of additional TLC, uh, trees that um, do not have a whole lot of insect and disease issues, and trees that are going to produce fruit fairly reliably for you uh, without a whole lot of additional care on your part. Uh, the list of fruiting plants is extensive, but, you know, we take something like a peach. Everybody loves fresh peaches, but what we know about peaches in Fort Bend County is that you have to spray them. You have to apply disease and insect control sprays to those plants uh, or they'll die, or the fruit will have worms in them every year and fall off the plant before you can get them. So, you know, that's why there are certain things that, uh, you know, you'll see fruits uh, at nurseries and so forth that we just are, are hard to grow. You might put those into the backyard and, and have them in an area where you can do additional maintenance and spraying to those throughout the year, but they're probably not gonna be a candidate to put out in the front yard. Um, where you're having to go out there and work those trees multiple times through the year. You want something that, that's, that's pretty autonomous, and this is our list of uh, fruits that we would recommend for that. So, um, you know, the con this is kind of just the general concept here is we're replacing some of our annual plants with vegetables or herbs, as you can see from our demonstration garden here in Rosenberg, we've uh, we've added um, 
Um, looks like some Swiss chard, uh, rhubarb, uh, daylily cluster there, which the, if you haven't had the flowers of daylily, they uh, have a nice sweet uh, creamy texture to them. And some some salvias or sages in the background here, but we'll notice that you know not everything in this garden is edible, uh, but we're adding components to this just to increase the edible value of the landscape without diminishing from the aesthetics, the overall landscape design. And you know, so just uh, our our evergreen shrubbery which we, we kind of call green meatballs, which is just your typical range of uh, evergreen perennial shrubs that are, are common to most landscapes. We can start thinking about plants. In this case, we have rosemary to replace those evergreen shrubs, uh, something that fulfills that same value in the landscape, but uh, provides a, a, an edible component to it uh, it still gives us that same visual uh, effect in the garden. So just again, another short list of uh, some of our warm season vegetables and herbs that you might want to consider uh, adding into the design. Uh, nasturtium um, is, a, um, is a small uh, uh, herb. This has a peppery uh, foliage and flower to it. Uh, it has a multiple color uh, of, of flower from yellow, orange to red. Uh, the leaves on it look kind of like a dollar weed. It's got a circular little leaf. So it's an attractive plant and uh, it's a great plant to add to salads, uh, the foliage and the flowers of that plant. A um, whole lot of things that you can do with beans and peas. Um, <clears throat> probably most common are going to be our scarlet runner beans or hyacinth beans. And um, the scarlet runner has a, has a beautiful scarlet red uh, flower, produces you know, edible bean pods. Similar to that, the hyacinth bean is a, a kind of a purple lavender colored flower and produces a, a very attractive bean pod that's edible. A full range of peppers um, and some of the ornamental peppers have some spectacular range of variegation and color differentials on them. Or some of them that have almost black foliage, uh, purple foliage, variegated. Um, and then there's peppers that uh, have multiple colors of peppers on the same plant. So that can add a, a whole lot of different color and texture differential to the garden uh, during the warm season. Uh, sweet potato uh, is, a, is a great one, but this one right here, I probably want to put an asterisk next to it because this can get very aggressive if it's not kept in a spot. It'll take over the whole landscape and uh, you'll have a whole lot of work getting it out of there. But if you can choose the variety, there are some of the ornamental varieties of sweet potato that have smaller foliage and less of an aggressive uh, spreading habit to them probably would be a better choice than just our common garden sweet potato, which is kind of a beast. Uh, eggplant, again, lots of different colors, shapes, sizes to eggplant, the actual plant itself and the fruit. There's some, you know, big round, uh, there's white, there's pink, purple, and then there's some of the long uh, tapered eggplant fruit that can give you additional appeal. There are lots of mints that are good in the landscape, uh, but but also also here with this one, be careful with a perennial mint, particularly uh, spearmint, peppermint, um, that uh, it is very aggressive and can cover a big area. So we might um, delegate that to a container, a large pot as an accent in a pot. Uh, or, a, or choose a non-trailing type mint. Um, a similar plant, uh, Mexican mint marigold, is a little, um, little sunflower relative that has uh, small little yellow flowers and the foliage is uh, noted as a, a tarragon replacement, has this nice kind of licorice type smell to it. Um, it's uh, beautiful with uh, culinary dishes, but uh, also just for the fragrance of it. 
lots of different types of basils, colors of basils, um, sizes, and, and you know, overall heights um, that, that add a whole lot of value uh, for our herbs. Uh, you can do lots of different stuff with cooking with this, and they attract a whole lot of pollinators, uh, really attracted to basil. Similarly, uh, with sage, lots of different salvias and sages that we can add, add to the garden that we're actually we're using for food, for herbs, and for pollinators, dill and fennel. Um, and you'll see these both on the cool season because they, they do kind of transition over uh, into the, to the warmer season from cool uh, salad burnet. And then I added these two here, Roselle, which is another hibiscus relative that makes a really attractive kind of burgundy plant. And it has these, these large hibiscus flowers. And if you do a little research on Roselle, you'll find there's a whole lot of uses. You can harvest the leaves off of it um, but mainly we use the flower pods uh, for a tea. Uh, it's a nice sweet tea uh, that you make out of those uh, sepals uh, from the flowers. And then Malabar, which is a um, tropical, tropical vine that is a, a spinach um, alternate uh, that uh, you can grow up on a trellis or a fence and uh, harvest. Uh, as spinach. So lots of good ideas of this list could be probably 10 times as big, but these are some common ones that we've worked with up here that, that did well for us. <clears throat> cool season, uh, vegetables and herbs to consider. Lettuce, um, there's so many different colored leaf lettuces available that you can create a, a pretty attractive uh, garden with the leaf lettuces, but even head lettuce, like our bibs, uh, iceberg types, and um, romaine, create a nice, uh, you know, appeal to a single plant. Uh, spinach, carrots, uh, Swiss chard, or beets, um, cabbages, lots of different cabbages uh, out there. Uh, broccoli, again with the broccoli, you know, once it is matured, it kind of goes away, but, you know, a good healthy broccoli plant, especially some of the ones that have the, the uh, yellow or the purple uh, uh, broccoli and, and cauliflower heads on them uh, are pretty nice. There's the broccolini that will have small little uh, flower heads around the top of it, so it can create a really nice texture. Uh, several different types of parsleys that are out there that can create you know, good green uh, texture to the landscape. Arugula, uh, cilantro, kale, fennel, dill. Um, this bronze fennel, if you've grown that, has this uh, kind of burgundy maroon uh, color to the plant and makes a kind of a large plant. You could put it on the, as a backdrop of the landscape to kind of raise that up on the backside. Again, you know, using each of these in the correct spot in the landscape, thinking about a tiered approach to your garden, stuff like our carrots and spinach, they're going to, it's a small plant. The foliage is going to max out at a foot high, uh, where some of these plants um, can get quite large or quite tall, and we're going to move those further back into the landscape. So this, uh, this chart can be accessed from uh, the Fort Bend Master Gardeners website, which is fbmg.org. But, uh, you know, really goes through all of our seasonal vegetables for Fort Bend County and, and helps you kind of design a schedule of when we might want to implement these plants into our garden. Uh, for instance, I'll start off with the beets. Okay, the fourth one down is beets. When I scroll over on the calendar, there's a little red area there in February that suggests that we have a limited window where, where we can plant beets in the garden and then a long period where we don't want 
to have them because it just gets too hot. And then we get over to September and into October, we see this green area. And this suggests that this is our, our ideal planting time for beets. And then we have another little red area from October to November, with the, which suggests that this is another marginal uh, planting time. So, you know, in designing our garden beds, we're gonna put these beets, plan on putting them in the garden sometime in September and then probably are going to enjoy that foliage um, all through the fall and then over into the late fall and then by March or April those plants are going to start fizzling out for us and we'll know we need to plant something else in that spot because they're going to they're going to burn up as soon as the heat comes on. But a good chart again if you go to our uh, fbmg.org that's the website for the Fort Bend Master Gardeners um, dig around in there and we can find this chart uh, which is very helpful for for, for you um, companion planting um, and the concept here is that we're, we're planting certain things together mainly to help them minimize um, insect issues is kind of the, the big the big thing with with companion planting so some things to think about here and we look at the stuff that's over on the left and we're seeing aromatic herbs it's kind of the main concept here it's pretty simple mostly aromatic herbs that have some type of uh, uh, oil release or a fragrance that is going to either throw off or repel uh, insects from moving into an area of our garden. So, um, you know, rosemary, basil, mint, garlic, thyme, dill, marigolds down here, I believe uh, specifically this would be a, a French marigold. <clears throat> Add these into guard, the garden in different areas and cert certain times of the year uh, amongst these other plants here that are more prone to uh, insect issues, um, it's going to minimize those outbreaks and populations naturally so that we're not having to respond with, uh, with some type of a pest control product. Uh, so you know, similar to that, edible, edibles uh, in our evergreen herb category, chives, oregano, rosemary, thyme, and mint. Again, here we've got this asterisk here on the mint just to maybe put that mint in a container so that it doesn't take over the whole garden, uh, which several of them will, will do that. So thinking about containers, uh, containers are a great way to add a focal point or visual appeal to certain parts of our landscape, particularly if you've got smaller yard. Um, this is a, a good way to add you know, more depth to that small space. Um, we can easily change these out, the plants that are in these containers uh, based off of the seasons. We can, we can fill a bare spot in the landscape or we can block a view of something that uh, maybe a, a, you know, an irrigation or a cable box or something that maybe is an eyesore. We can use a, a large container with uh, plant material to, uh, to camouflage those items. Um, <clears throat> we, can, we can contain fast spreading plants like, like mints, uh, Mexican petunias. Like I said, with uh, sweet potatoes, um, kind of kind of holds them down a little bit. Um, we can plant fruit trees um, in large containers, uh, particularly plants that need some type of winter protection, mangoes, moringa, citrus. Um, there's a long list of subtropicals that people are playing around with. Uh, that will need winter protection. So we have the ability to move that plant into the garage or into a protected location if we needed to for the winter. Uh, one thing just to remember is the size of the container matters is that if you've got a, 
large plant, a plant that wants to be big, and we put that in a small container, it's just never going to perform the way we would hope uh, unless there's enough rooting space in that container for the plant to grow uh, with health. So do your homework, match those up appropriately as far as the size goes. Um, and um, enjoy it. So a couple ideas here again, um, prob probably not an apple, but uh, the smaller uh, citrus, particularly if you're looking at labels of citrus and it says dwarf, uh, this means that the plant has been grafted onto a dwarfing rootstock, which will keep the overall size of that plant down to a minimum. Uh, those are great um, plants for large containers. Uh, blueberry uh, is a, uh, you know, it's got a beautiful color to the foliage. Uh, it's got attractive kind of pinkish flowers on it before the fruit comes on. It's a smaller plant, so it's going to fit in a container uh, nicely compared to, you know, something like a pear. Um, even a fig is hard to grow in a container because they, they want to become big plants and you need a very large container to satisfy the soil needs for the root system. Or like this picture over here, where we're just uh, utilizing a mixture of herbs to create different types of texture appeal uh, in the landscape, kind of bring some height into the landscape so everything's not down on the ground. Uh, so that, that creates an additional uh, visual value uh, from your, uh, your uh, design. <clears throat> it gives you a lot of room to start kind of getting creative and thinking about different ways to do it. Uh, we see on both these pictures, this is called a spalier, and we're training uh, these fruit trees along cables. Um, it's a good way to cover, you know, brick wall, other structures, fences, etc. And, and, and grow fruits in a way where maybe we don't have room for a full-size tree, um, but we can train this along a, a fence uh, so that we can you know, get the, the plant appeal and then actually be able to harvest some fruit off of a space that otherwise would just be a hardscape structure. And we see here with this is we have a good combination of colors and textures within this design. Here's one of these ornamental peppers. Uh, I mean, so much stuff is going on with that one little plant. We have a, a variegated foliage. <clears throat> so we have a little white, grayish, silver, and purple and green on the foliage. And then these fruits are probably gonna be a black or really dark purple colored fruit. Um, this has a whole lot of color and texture appeal to one little plant. Then we have some you know, green foliage. We have contrasting colors uh, within the design. We've got some, some strappy, this looks like society garlic in the background. That gives us a, a more upright linear appeal. So you know, be creative, mix up plants, you know, try all different things and, and, uh, and see what you can come up with. This is one of our garden volunteers up here in, in the office. And, this was a, a area that, that we call the edible front yard, where for years we just ripped out plants and tried different combinations uh, of color and texture and species and, and really ended up coming out with a, with a whole lot of really nice ideas on how we can implement those uh, into a you know, front yard garden design that would be acceptable to your, to your HOA. So while we're, while we're showing pictures of our demonstration gardens, I'd like to just put in a, a plug about what we do over here in Rosenberg. Uh, we're right over here next to the fairgrounds. If you haven't been uh, to the extension office or visited the Master Gardener demonstration gardens, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, here's just a short list of some of the themed gardens that we've got here. And you know, I walked out there today and this butterfly and probably 20 other 
species of butterflies were, were, were actively fluttering around the butterfly and the superstar gardens. Uh, just spectacular with this weather. Plants are looking really good. So take a hike to um, Rosenberg and come check us out. Um, there's no fencing on the garden, so you can come up anytime. Um, so we encourage you to do so. Here's a, a couple of basic links, just plugs to our own people. Um, the Aggie Horticulture website is, um, is a dynamic uh, online library of resources from everything horticulture. So fruits, vegetables, uh, herbs, pecan trees, uh, composting materials, all the earth kind resources. So um, utilize that. You can just, on your search engine, if you just typed in Aggie horticulture, it's always gonna pop up first on your search results. Uh, the next one here is our, um, our county extension website. This is fortbend.agrilife.org. And then our super fine Fort Bend Master Gardeners is uh, fbmg.org. And a lot of good resources on Fort Bend gardening on that website. Right here are my email and office phone number. That's jbholiday at ag.temu.edu. And then 281-342-3034. We'll get me or we'll get you to our um, Master Gardener hotline. We do have trained research volunteers here in our office Monday through Friday in the morning. So typically from about nine to noon, uh, we have um, eager Master Gardener volunteers that are answering phone calls, that are answering emails, that are visiting with walk-in customers uh, that um, will help help out with any type of horticulture question that you have. And uh, and, and provide resources that are non-biased and research-based. So take advantage of that. It's a good free service in our community. And here's just kind of a, a base of resources that help to build this presentation. Um, you'll, you can come back through the recording when you get this, if you wanna look at any of these individually. A um, lot of good stuff online um, and um, there, it's there 24 seven. So uh, with that, uh, that's gonna wrap up the active part of my presentation. I would like to go here in a minute and go back to our Soil Lab website and show you how to kind of go through the soil sample process. But uh, in the meantime here, this is our plug to get your feedback. Um, this URL in the middle will take you to an online survey. But if you have one of those QR readers, for your phone, you can you can take a picture of that QR code that will take you directly to our online survey. Just a couple short questions uh, to see if you like the presentation and if you have ideas or suggestions for, for further topics uh, in the future. So with that, Suma, I'll take any questions. Okay, so you said you are going to talk about the home soil test. Mm -hmm. And then there is one other question uh, from Michael. He's asking, since you recommended the routine analysis uh, for garden soils, he's asking, is that also recommended for lawns? Like, more specifically, he's asking if the $12 routine analysis is sufficient for the lawns or do they have to get more thorough test? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for a homeowner... Uh, the routine uh, analysis is going to give you everything that you need. Um, typically, <clears throat> we start recommending um, micronutrients, organic matter, uh, some of these additional tests, if this is a business. So if you're a lawn care company and your job is to make somebody's grass just perfect, then yeah, we're going to start looking at some of those more advanced samples. Uh, if you're a, a vegetable farmer, if you're a fruit and nut farmer, or you do anything agriculturally for a living that, that depends on the, the perfect balance of nutrients in your soil, 
then we're going to start recommending some of those more advanced samples. But I honestly believe for a homeowner, for, for you know, trees, shrubs, grass, hornmills, uh, edible plants, the routine analysis gives us a pretty good snapshot of what, where we're at and what we need to be doing. And I'll, I'll go through that once we move off of this. Okay. Um, there is an interesting question, actually. I was also wondering about this from Larry. Please elaborate a bit on the insects that rosemary and basil help repel. So she, he is interested in the reasons behind the companion groupings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the concept, just in theory, uh, is really the only perceived real benefit. So, you know, with the work that we do in extension, it, stuff has to be research based. So, so you know, the really the only thing that we see that's a value with companion planting is that these aromatic herbs have the ability to throw off the senses of insects, in our case, pest, pest potential insects, um, that you know basically camouflages your plants more than they would be without those aromatic herbs in the vicinity. <clears throat> Partic particulars of each of those, we, we'd have to do a whole nother deep dive into that. That'd be a whole nother presentation for today. But if it's the Larry, I think it is, let's talk about it later. Um, other questions before I move off into the, the Soil Lab website? No, I don't see any other questions. Okay, cool. I'm gonna go ahead and unshare this PowerPoint and uh, we'll take you over real quick. We'll go to the uh, go to the internet. So if we just whatever your search engine here is, we're gonna just do like soil testing Tamu. Should work pretty good. So if I enter for that, it's gonna pop up right here at the top. Or if I just did soil testing tamu edu it's going to take us to the same place and we scroll down just a little bit here we'll see all these links here <clears throat> and then this one here says our submittal forms we'll click on that and then um, we want this urban soil submittal form I say that because if you choose this soil submittal form, this is for large scale agriculture. So whenever they, whenever you fill out the forms on here, they're they're talking about acres of land that that these the soil sample is representing. Okay, and so you're probably not sampling acres of land. You're, you're sampling a, a section of your home landscape. And so this form is going to do that for us. Let's see. Well, I might have to do something funny here. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. OK. Sometimes this is goofy. Go roundabout way, but I'll get it done. Okay, so here's here's a picture of the the form. And so at the top up here, you just fill out your basic information here, and here's the information for your payment, and and here is um, here's the different types of analyses that you can do. And again, like I mentioned. You know, the more detailed that you need to get, the cost goes up quite a bit for each sample. But for, for what our purposes today, this right here, the routine analysis, this gives you uh, the soil pH, your nitrate levels, phosphorus, uh, potassium, calcium, magnesium, uh, our salts, and um, 
sulfur, along with the soil uh, electroconductivity. But these are all what we call our macronutrients, and these are the nutrients that plants use the most. And so that's why this is the routine samples, because this is the stuff that we're really, really, it's really important because plants need these the most. When we get into a more detailed setting for a business, then we start getting into adding our micronutrients uh, in our organic matter, our soil texture analysis, so on and so on. We can keep adding more of these values onto the sample. But for $12, we can get all our pH and we can get all these macronutrients um, uh, tested. And then what happens is that they're going to email you back a, <coughs> a response that shows what your nutrient levels are and, and what um, nutrients that are recommended that you apply in, in a certain amount. So if the nitrogen is low, it's going to say you need so many pounds of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet. Um, so just a little math, a little calculation, you can figure out how, how much of each nutrient we need to apply uh, to that area to balance out the nutrients. So, so while um, <clears throat> we have a, a, a little bag up here at our office that we offer free of charge, we we'll even give people a little cardboard box to, to pack it all in up and mail it. You, you don't have to do that. You can do it all from home. So here's how you, you fill this out. You give it, you give the sample an ID, talk about the amount of square footage, fertilization that you've used, and then I am growing here. Um, we put in this, um, this uh, letter value that corresponds with this list down here. So we would say D, uh, vegetable garden, or other, depending on what we're what we're testing for in this and the plants grown in this area. So we can do shade trees, fruit trees, turf grasses, um, annuals, perennials, and vegetables, herbs, etc. And we just designate the um, the correct uh, letter for that. And then the requested analysis would be one, which is the routine, and that's that's it. And so the second page of the form talks about where to sample, how to collect the sample, and then mailing the sample to the lab. So as you, you can either use our fancy soil testing bag, or you can just use a Ziploc bag, um, and then just use a Sharpie to, to write the, <clears throat> write the, um, the sample number on it. If you're doing multiple samples, make sure that we label each of those bags clearly so that we know that we're testing the right soil for the right place. And it tells you here how, how, where to mail it to. And then they're gonna do all the hard work and then send you the results back. So really is pretty simple. Um, and for $12 plus the amount for the shipping, um, it's definitely worth it to, be able to respond with the right nutrients and you will notice uh, the difference. I'll just say that <clears throat> that when um, that when I see results that people email me um, that they've just been using uh, you know a garden fertilizer or a lawn food, the numbers are always really whacked out. Um, and, and the result for us of adjusting those, um, that the feedback that we get from people is that they've, they're, they're usually in a turf grass situation. It's really improved by responding to the correct nutrients. Just real quick, I want to show this, the Aggie Horticulture website that I mentioned. Uh, it's broken down into some big categories here. Um, <clears throat> so a, a ton of resources. The fruit and nut resources here, vegetable, and then wrapped around what we're talking about today is the Earth Kind of Landscaping web portal um, and a ton of resources within that. 
Um, I, I can't leave out the Texas superstar area over here for Suma. Uh, she's our she's our Texas superstar superstar here in Fort Bend County. Um, but this is a huge resource, ton of good stuff here uh, for um, for the public. Really cool. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. Thanks for the plug. And I'm back over here. All right. Well, how are we doing? So we are doing good. Uh, I think this, like Michael wants to know how long does it take to get back the results of the soil test? Mm, that's a real good question. So there is there is some seasonality to the lab because as we have two labs in the state of Texas. One's in College Station. The other one's up in Lubbock. And they're, they're taking samples from any and everybody, including agricultural producers. So we, there are quite a, a, a large amount of ag operators that use the lab in early spring or late winter and um, August and September to prepare for winter garden crops. Um, so I tend to recommend people to stay out of those, those high um need times so january you know just december january and then the middle of summer are really good times to do your sampling and just send those to the lab if it's off season um less than two weeks i would say you'll get the analysis done and the response back but like in the peak of spring you know february um you know, it could be a month, five weeks uh, before we get those results back because of just the number of results uh, of samples that are sent to the lab. So a week and a half to five or six weeks, depending on when we're sending it. Thanks, Boone. And then also, do you just put the check in the box with the sample? <clears throat> yeah. Um, if the if the soil is dry, I think you're okay. If the soil is damp, I put the check in the form inside of a separate Ziploc bag uh, in case it, uh, the bag leaches out moisture for some reason. But yeah, yeah, just put it all, put the form, the application form with the payment in there with the bags and uh, put it in a small box, some type of small box when you're mailing that out. And again, if you want, if, if you wanted to come up to our office, we do have uh, these really nice kind of waxed uh, hard paper sacks uh, that hold the soil real nicely. And then we, we do offer uh, complimentary uh, boxes as well. Um, but uh, you don't have to take advantage of that. You can do it all from home. If anyone has any questions, you can unmute yourself and ask them now. Um, if not, I don't see any questions in the chat. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. I uh, I compost, and uh, we have a vegetable garden in uh, some raised beds in our suburban backyard. And so I'm pretty sure my soil differs from bed to bed. Uh, would I be, should I be sending a sample from each of those beds? Um, the, the directions on the soil sample kind of dive into that a little bit. And the, the short answer is that if the soil texture is different and or we've treated that soil uh, different um, within the, like the last three years, um, then those would be separate samples. But if it's, if it's just, you know, one side of your front yard to the other, if the soil is the same color, same texture, 
you've treated both of those areas the same way. So like they've, they've both been flower beds and you've added compost to those generally in the same amount, then you can, you can lump that into one sample. But if you've got one side of your yard and there's a slope and you notice that maybe this soil over here is kind of a loam soil, it's more sandy, it's more loose versus the other side over here, maybe a dark gray clay type soil. Uh, those would be two different samples because each of those soil textures are gonna hold uh, nutrients in different ways. And then similarly, if we have one side of the yard that we've fertilized it with grass fertilizer for years, and then the other side over here, we've had a, a ground cover uh, and there's some trees. We've treated those differently with inputs, whether they're organic inputs or fertilizers, uh, those would need to be different samples. But in general, if we've treated them the same way and the soil texture is similar, then we can lump those into one sample. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any, any other questions, Suma? No, I don't see anything else. Alone. Okay. We are gonna have to give me an award. I finished on time today. Yeah, you did. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was a great presentation as always. Yeah, it's a fun topic too. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, make sure you take take the time to uh, complete.